All right, I guess let's get started. We'll talk about heterogeneous multi-core systems today. So it should be fun. I've already given you some basic ideas. And you know homework seven. Uh, these are actually, this should be lab, homework six grades, right? Yeah. That's right. I wish labs, lab six grades were like this. <laughs> I have a feeling they won't, be, they won't look like this. But hopefully they will. Um, so some of you, I think, are not submitting the homework. So uh, this may not affect your grade significantly, but this may affect how well you do on the exam. So I'd encourage you to look at them, even if you haven't submitted them. And this is your lab, which is due uh, later this week on Friday. But you have an extension. Final exam, we've talked about this. Uh, to prepare for the final exam, some, some tips for you. Homework seven is for your benefit, for preparation. And we have all the past exams, including this semester's exams. So if you haven't understood some question from this semester, you should definitely understand it and uh, figure out ways to understand it. You can talk with the TAs, talk with me. But definitely go through the past exams, as well as the past final. Uh, recitation session, uh, this Friday we'll have a recitation session. Uh, Wednesday will be a lecture. Justin will talk about emerging memory technologies. That's an area that should be fun to uh, think about. We briefly talked about it, but uh, it'll be a full lecture, full-blown lecture on it. Uh, and Friday would be recitation. So go to the recitation with questions, hopefully. Although you will be doing the lab as well, so. You'll have to prioritize accordingly. Remember, the final exam is 30% or 25% of your grade. I still haven't corrected that slide. I should. Uh, review session, uh, stay tuned. Based on your feedback, this will likely be May 4th or 5th. Does anyone have a preference for those? I know I asked this before. May 5th is a Sunday, right before the exam day. Is that better? Who thinks it's better? One, two, <laughs> three, four. <laughs> your hands are going up slowly. In, in serial order. <laughs> what about May 4th? Who thinks May 4th is better? Well, there's, I guess every, everybody else abstains. Who doesn't care? May 4th or May 5th? OK, that's good to. Maybe we, we'll, ha we'll have a poll on that. Is, that. is that easy to do on uh, Wiki? Yeah, let's try to do that. OK, uh, this is a note on 740. Uh, this will be the last lecture I have, actually. Uh, that's why I wanted to put this note. Uh, I'm teaching advanced computer architecture next semester, which is fall 2013, I think. So that's, that's going to be a deep dive into many of the topics we've covered and some topics we did not cover. It'll be more research oriented. Uh, right now, your projects are relatively uh, not free, right? So you have some freedom, especially in the uh, extra credit portions, but you don't have a whole lot of freedom in how you implement things. And that's the nature of an undergraduate course. We want, to really, uh, we want you to really understand the basics. If you want to actually explore design decisions that make contributions, like, uh, for example, design better caching algorithms, 740 is a good course uh, to take. So it'll, there'll be an open-ended research project. And the, t uh, the topics will be very, uh, similar. Basically, the goal will be cutting-edge research and topics in hardware software interface. So if you're enjoying 447, you can take it, but you'll uh, talk with me first. And also, uh, this is more general, if you're excited about computer architecture research or design, that should be research slash design, uh, or looking for a job or internship in this area, feel free to talk with me. Uh, maybe not for this summer, but not next summer or during the semester. I'm happy to get you in touch with the right uh, places. So more on 740. I briefly discussed this early on when people asked, but uh, it'll be an experiment also in hybrid education uh, the idea is lectures will be online. They will be pre-recorded. So you will watch them uh, and come to the recitations, which will be in person plus online. So they will be recorded as well as in person. So you'll be able to deep dive into the topics that you've already learned in the lectures, hopefully. So hopefully you've, done the, uh, you've read the lectures, you listened to them, and you made notes, and you, uh, you came up with questions, and you'll ask them during the recitation. So this will be much more interactive. And recitations will be done by me, mostly. Uh, there will be office hours. That, those will be in person as well as online. And everything will be recorded and posted online. So right now, we have pretty much everything online, right? But uh, this model is more diff a little bit different. So the goal is for you to uh, actually understand the material even better. And uh, if you have any question about the scheduling, uh, 
Uh, there, there are six hours scheduled for recitations. You don't need to be available for all of them. Actually, you don't really, really need to be available for any of them because everything will be online, right? But if you do want the uh, in-person interaction, then you're expected to be able to attend three, hours, three out of the six hours of recitation. And if it's two, that may be OK, too. <laughs> we'll do other things online. OK? That should be fun. So the goal is to actually use the best of both online and offline technologies. It's hybrid. It is heterogeneous, right? That's what we'll talk about today in multi-core systems also. If you want to get, to get the best of both worlds, online and offline, you have to have some heterogeneity. So this is very different from a very massive course where we actually put the course uh, online and everybody, uh, like everybody around the world listens to it. You have 20,000 or 40,000 attendees, but you don't get the benefits of the offline interaction, in-person interaction, which I think is very important, especially given that you guys have been attending these lectures, even though they're all online, right? And I see consistently many people are attending the lectures, and consistently some other people are not attending the lectures. And I don't know what's the difference between how these different people are doing. We'll do some analysis on that later on. But they're not, uh, they're th there's not too much difference, I think. It's, it's also uh, attending to different forms of learning of different students, I think. Some students are OK with learning online, and they don't need to attend the lectures. So we're catering that kind, uh, to that kind of behavior, learning behavior. And some students are not, uh, pr prefer to get this in-person interaction, which is also uh, okay, so we're catering to that kind of behavior. So we'll see that we'll do the design of multi-core systems that way also. One size fits all doesn't work, so why not have both options such that you can cater to different kinds of demands? That's the same idea, right? Every, every concept we have in computer architecture comes from real life. It's all intuitive. <laughs> okay. Okay, course evaluations is also important. These are due May 13th. And I do care a lot about them. Uh, that's why we've been giving you feedback forms uh, over the course. Even though we may not be able to ad adjust everything, we'd like to make the course much better when we teach them next time, teach it next time. So do not forget to fill out the cor course evaluations. I'd like to get 100% <laughs> filling out rate uh, from you guys. So I'd appreciate if you take the time. It's because it's very important. I read this carefully and take into account every piece of feedback. Uh, there's conflicting feedback, and because of, just because of these different learning styles, right? Uh, so we cannot really have a single course that can adapt to everybody, everyone, but hopefully with the hybrid model, we'll be able to adapt to uh, different demands. And the goal over time is to kind of have a general purpose course, but somehow customize it dynamically to, to each of you based on your demands, eventually. And improve the course for the future. So please take the time to write out feedback that you have and state the things you liked, topics you enjoyed, and what we can improve on, and things you did not like also, both the good and not so good, and bad. <laughs> outright bad would be good also, although we do know some, some of the things that are outright bad, and we'll fix them in the next semester. OK, any questions on this? So you promised that you'll fill out the evaluations? In the old days, the evaluations used to be handwritten, right? And then everybody fell, uh, filled out the evaluations. But online evaluations, I don't know, the participation rate is probably lower with online evaluations. But you guys are a good bunch, so hopefully <laughs> you'll do it. <laughs> OK, last lecture, we, we wrapped up cache coherence. So we went through this sequence, as you remember, uh, simple protocols to more complicated protocols and your imagined protocols, hopefully. Uh, we talked about directory versus snooping trade-offs and scaling the directory-based protocols briefly. Then we talked about interconnects for most of the lecture. Why, why are they important? Topologies, routing algorithms, how do you handle contention? And we briefly talked about on-chip interconnects. Interconnects have been around for a long time. Whenever, uh, whenever you design a large-scale multiprocessor system, you need to interconnect the components somehow. Right? And in the past, in the 60s, in the early 60s, 70s, uh, people designed these large-scale supercomputers, and the interconnect was mostly off-chip. Today, as we put more cores on chip, the interconnect, similar kinds of interconnects are appearing on chip. But the design trade-offs on chip are very different from the design trade-offs that you have off chip, right? For example, implementation complexity is always a design, design trade-off in any system that you engineer. But it's a lot, uh, the hardware complexity is a lot uh, more important when you put things on chip. Right? Power is a constraint uh, that uh, is more, uh, as you put more things on chip, the 
power consumed by the interconnect becomes a bigger constraint on chip. Right? On the other hand, some things are easier on chip, uh, like wiring. You, can, you, you have a lot of wires, a lot of metal layers on chip, right? You can put a lot more wires between different routers on chip. So you have more, some flexibility in that. So the on-chip versus off-chip trade-offs you should probably think about. We haven't covered this as much. But on-chip interconnects have their own trade-offs, power and implementation complexity being the main limiters. But the upside is you get a lot of wiring that is on-chip. Right? And you can scale things with Moore's law, whereas it's harder uh, with, uh, with an off-chip interconnect. Okay? okay, today we'll talk about multi-core systems a little bit more especially focusing on handling serial and parallel bottlenecks better in a multi-core system. And this will lead us to heterogeneous multi-core systems. I don't know how much of my slides, my 150 slides that we're going to cover today, but <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a good overview of uh, what uh, heterogeneous systems look like. And again, the principles here we have are applicable to not only multi-core systems, that's why I have par par in parentheses, heterogeneous multi-core. Multi-core was in parentheses. In, uh, in the lecture uh, that Justin will give on Wednesday, uh, he will talk about hybrid memory systems, heterogeneous memory systems that uh, contain multiple different types of technologies and management mechanisms to get the best of both technologies. Here we will talk about multi-core systems that contain multiple different types of cores for the purposes of overcoming some serial and parallel bottlenecks. Okay, so let's start. Uh, with the multi-core design. So you, you've probably seen the slide before uh, in one of the lectures. But uh, the reason we put uh, more cores on a chip today is it's, hard, it's, it's become very hard to scale the single thread performance. We're getting lots of transistors, but uh, it's becoming very hard to scale the uh, performance improvements that we get from a single thread. And you know the reasons. We've covered out-of-order execution. The, those structures are hard to scale. Uh, but it's a lot easier to take design a single core and stamp it out on chip and have a nice regular interconnect. Right? Now your design complexity has gone down significantly. In fact, that's one of the big arguments for multi-core. Your design complexity is simple. And the hope is that if the programmer can parallelize their program nicely, you get much, much better performance because you have large-scale parallelism on chip. Right? You don't need to rely on sophisticated techniques to extract performance out of a single thread. Right? Uh, again, it's a programmer microarchitect trade-off that's being made. Uh, with multi-core design, right? The, des the life is easier for the microarchitect with a stamped out multi-core system because they ju uh, you just need to design one core and stamp it out. Uh, but the life is much harder for the programmer now. They need to parallelize the program. On the other hand, what's, if you needed to design a single core system that used all of these transistors uh, to improve performance of a single thread, then the life is much harder for the uh, microarchitect, but much easier for the programmer, hopefully. Now, that's not always true. Sometimes it's easier to parallelize the program. And if, you, if that's the case, multi-core has an advantage over a single core because now you can actually execute many things in parallel. Right? If you want to execute many workloads in parallel, there's an advantage to multi-core compared to a single core. Instead of time multiplexing the single core or multi-threading the single core, you execute the programs in different cores. Okay? So it's not always that program microarchitect trade-offs that you see in multi-core. Okay, so what we want is, I think I've shown you this before also, n times the performance with n times the cores when we parallelize an application on n cores, right? Beautiful, this is the linear scaling, right, that we had with Amdahl's law. Well, that we had with uh, the curves that I've shown you, uh, the parallelizable fraction, uh, the number of cores that you get and uh, the performance that you get. But what we get today is Amdahl's law, right? We have serial bottleneck, and we uh, have bottlenecks in the parallel portion. And you already know this, we already talked about this a lot. This is just to jog your memory. Serial bottleneck limits your parallelism and synchronization overhead, load imbalance overhead, and resource sharing overhead that happens in the parallel portion of the program, which is not taken into account in Amdahl's law, also limits your performance. Uh, so the problem is really these serialized code sections. I'll generalize everything by saying serialized code sections. It's not only serial bottleneck. Many parallel programs cannot be parallelized completely today, and that's the hard problem. If, if, if something can be parallelized easily, then it's, it's an easy problem, right? You don't necessarily want to solve that problem. But you'd like to solve the problem of programs that cannot be parallelized completely. So what are the causes of these serialized code sections? We've talked about sequential portions. Critical sections, we've also talked about things that protect shared data. Barriers, we've also talked about different threads synchronize, need to synchronize at a point. They all need to get to that point, and then they can 
uh, continue. And there's also limiter stages on pipeline programs. We briefly talked about pipeline programs early on, right? Basically, you divide a program into stages, a loop iteration, maybe stage one, produces data for stage two, and then produces data for stage three. And you can execute these stages on different cores. Core zero, uh, core one can execute this, core two can execute this, and core three can execute this. And you can actually have, so if you have a loop iteration, you have for loop, basically you can parallelize this program this way, stage one, stage two, stage three. And hopefully you minimize the communication between stages. The hope is that different iterations, different instances of these stages from different iterations execute on the same core. And maybe they have some locality in the data. So stage one from iteration one. And then you have stage two from iteration two, dot, 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 executing on this core. Stage two instances executing on this core. Stage three instances executing on this core. Right. Now in such a program, such a pipeline parallel program, you again have bottlenecks. In this case, your throughput is really limited by uh, which stage is processed the slowest. Right? If this stage is taking much longer than these two stages, eventually these things communicate. You'll have much fewer stages uh, left on core zero and core three. So this stage will be your bottleneck. Make sense? Or that core would be your bottleneck. So we would like to get rid of these limiter stages. That's what, what I mean by a limiter stage or a bottleneck stage. Somehow identify that. So these kind of serialized code sections happen in pretty much all kinds of parallel programs. So can we, uh, well, what is the downside of this? Obviously these reduce performance, right? They limit your parallelism. They limit scalability. Scalability meaning that's the scale, this, is, this is a scalability graph. This is the number of processors start from one. And this is the speed up. you get uh, speed up versus one processor. And linear scaling is nice, but most of the time we get something like this. Right. And we've discussed why you get something like that, right? Well, one of the reasons is these serialized code sections. And these also waste energy, right? Once you're serialized, you have lots of these processors running, and some of them are just twiddling their thumbs, right? They're not doing much. They're waiting for others. So we'd like to get rid of these problems. One example, it's a very high level example from MySQL. Actually, I had the code and I put it, uh, I decided to abstract it away. But you can go and look at this MySQL database. It's an open database. It's a public database. Uh, basically, a thread, when it gets generated, it's trying to respond to a query. It first opens some database tables to figure out what data to access. And then once it figures out what data to access, it performs some operations on that data. This is usually parallel. There's a lot of parallelism in this section. But this opening of database tables, because other threads are also opening, closing, and manipulating these database tables, which rows and which columns in the database to access, this tends to be uh, very serial. Uh, well, there is a critical section that needs to happen here, because other threads are manipulating this uh, significantly. So that's a critical section. So if you look at this application, MySQL, this is a scalability graph here. You have the chip area in terms of number of cores, and this is the speed up you get compared to one one core, its performance peaks at around, I believe, 13 or 14 threads. And then you lose performance because now you have communication overhead, right? Because you have too many threads and they're ping-ponging some cache lines because one is writing to a cache line and the other is ne uh, needing it. And that becomes a lot higher as you increase the number of chip uh, 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 as, as you increase the number of cores. You also have resource contention overhead as well. So this contains all of those overheads. Uh, because you have too much resource contention, your performance goes down. You, may, you have too many robot for conflicts because you have 24 threads, for example, right? Okay, so I'll show you, in this talk, I'll show you a mechanism that actually increases, uh, changes the speed up curve to this. And that's the idea of heterogeneity. Today, we have symmet symmetric multi-core. If we have some asymmetric or heterogeneous multi-core, you can actually achieve something like this. So, uh, motivation is we have demands in different code sections, right? As I told you earlier, different, different, uh, you're all different and you, you demand different things. Code sections are similar. They demand different things. In a serialized code section, what we want is a really this core that we did not want to design in the first place, right? The heavy 
core, that gets you a lot of single thread performance. Basically, one powerful large core that gets out of the serial section quickly. In a parallel code section where you don't have a serialized serialization, you perhaps want many, many wimpy small cores, right? So that you can get the scalability in that parallel section. Remember, you can, you, we would like to divide uh, the, uh, the parallel fraction with the number of cores, okay? You can reduce the execution time. But these two conflict with each other, obviously, as I've shown you here, right? If you have a single powerful core, you cannot have many cores. You can have many threads. You can do fine-grained multi-threading, which can get some of the advantages of these many wimpy small cores. But that also reaches some scalability limits, right? That's, if you remember the fine-grained multi-threading, you lose actually single thread performance. You need to have a way of actually using that large core again. You can have simultaneous multi-threading also, which we do not get into, but we'll get into in 740 if you take it. Uh, then you can get some of the benefits uh, of you having a single powerful core, but also many threads at the same time, but also that, that also reaches its scalability limit because you cannot scale up the register file size, for example, of a single core uh, to accommodate many threads. On the other hand, a small core is much more area and energy efficient than a large core, right? So you would like to have many small cores. Okay, so what are these large and small cores? Uh, let's take a look at a large core. This is what I mean by a large core. It looks something like the Alpha 21 264. Actually, much better than that, hopefully. I think Intel Haswell is a large core, for example, today. It's a, it's a more, much more efficient large core. It's out of order. It, has, it employs all of these ILP, instruction level parallelism enhancing techniques for, to improve single thread performance. Wide fetch, deep pipelines, aggressive branch prediction, multiple functional units, memory dependent speculation, all of the things that we've talked about. We did not talk about trace cache. Actually, we did briefly talk about trace cache, right? A trace cache, uh, an instruction cache uh, stores uh, instructions uh, in the order they're located, right, based on their location. A trace cache stores traces. Remember trace scheduling? Uh, trace scheduling identified the trace program path uh, based on uh, profiling. A trace cache dynamically does that. The idea is you have this control flow graph. And the hardware dynamically identifies which control path is executed. Let's say A, B, C, D is executed at runtime. And it basically forms a trace dynamically and stores these instructions in the order, in the trace order, instead of the program counter order. So whenever you index A, you get A, B, C, D in the trace cache. So this is what your trace cache looks like. You get A, B, C, D. Right. Whereas in an instruction cache, A may be in one location, B may be in some other location, C may be in some other location, and maybe D may be in another location because they're not necessarily laid out consecutively by the, uh, by the compiler. Right. So why is this a good idea? Now you can have sequential fetch, very wide fetch. right? That has some of the benefits of trace scheduling at the compiler level. But now your hardware stores these traces. So this gets you better performance, better branch prediction performance, as well as better wider fetch, benefits of wider fetch. And we will talk about this more in 740, but this is just to give you an idea of some of the other techniques that are used to enhance single thread performance. So on the other hand, small core is in order. It has narrow fetch, shallow pipeline, maybe a simple branch predictor, maybe not. You can get away with branch prediction if you have fine-grained multi-threading. And we'll see an example of a small core that was designed by Sun that actually doesn't have this branch predictor. And few functional units. So this is actually a rule of thumb. Uh, this is not always true, obviously. Large cores are power inefficient. Actually, uh, for 4x the area correlated with power, you get 2x the performance on a single thread. And you'd be lucky as you increase the area that you keep on this curve. This is actually not true as, as you increase the area. But let's assume that for now. And actually, this is some data from uh, uh, Intel uh, that was published in this conference uh, in 2004 that looks at similar parameters here. So if you look at the large core, its microarchitecture is out of order, small core in order, its pipeline depth and width. Uh, this is a normalized performance. I guess they were, uh, they were quite optimistic here. Like you get 5 to 8x performance of a small core with the large core, and the normalized power is significant, 20 to 50x. And normalized energy per instruction is significantly higher with the large core also. Uh, 
So if you want to optimize for energy, maybe you want all small cores, except if you have critical low serialized code sections, right? Because you may be wasting a lot more energy if you have small cores when you uh, have these serialized sections. So I will not talk about energy that much, but everything I say about performance today will be applicable to energy also. Maybe the benefits will change a little bit, but for, uh, if you want to optimize for energy, you would like to have some heterogeneity, have some both, both types of cores in the system perhaps. So let's take a look at some of these large cores and small cores. I already told you that uh, a lot of Intel and AMD systems are like that, but this is one of the earliest multi-core systems actually, IBM Power 4. And this is a beautiful paper that talks about the system microarchitecture of uh, IBM Power 4. I'll, I'll recommend you to read this. This is a symmetric multi-core chip, and it has fewer and more powerful cores. I'm not going to go into the detail. You can uh, look at this paper. But it's, it actually can execute 100, uh, it has a 100 entry instruction window in each core. I think Intel Haswell today has 192 entries. This is eight wide instruction fetch, issue, execute, and it does cracking of those instructions to UOPS, something like UOPS. Uh, uh, and it has a large local plus global hybrid branch predictor, large cache, aggressive stream-based prefetching. Lots of things to improve single thread performance. IBM Power 5 is very similar, except it's multi-threaded. It's again a, a multi-core chip that's, that's pretty old. Let's look at the small one. This is Sun Niagara. This is actually one of the first multi-core chips also. And the approach was exactly opposite. So IBM's approach, let's get these uh, very large cores and put them together. Why their market actually demanded that single thread performance? They were catering to uh, these uh, organizations that, for example, did very high frequency trading. And if you have a thread that's not, uh, uh, that's slowed down, now you, you see a performance loss. That's why they wanted these big cores. On the other hand, Niagara was designed for a very different uh, design point uh, for online, uh, some of the transaction processing, web applications, web server applications. And the hope was that these were very throughput oriented. There was a lot of parallelism in these applications. You have one web query, and another web query comes, and another web query comes, so you can service them in different threads. So the cores here, they had this engine with eight cores. This is the first Niagara, and uh, each was four-way multi-threaded. So the cores were very, very simple. Uh, this is the system architecture. We don't need to go into that. But this is what a core looks like. It's four-way fine-grained multi-threaded. It has six stages. It's dual issue in order. And you have round-robin thread selection, unless there's a cache miss. And we've seen this before, actually. You've seen this slide, something similar to this slide. Now your core doesn't even have a branch predictor here. So it's purely fine-grained multi-threaded. You never fetch, uh, you never have two instructions in the pipeline from a single thread. Actually, single thread after it matters. So branches resolve here, so you can actually fetch uh, the next instruction over here, okay? And there was actually a shared floating point unit among cores as well. So if you want single thread performance, high floating point unit performance, you really want one core to utilize its own single floating point unit, right? But that's the trade-off they made. They shared the floating point unit. In fact, later on, uh, they realized that adding a branch predictor is a good idea, not sharing the floating point unit is a good idea, even in their workloads. So even in their workloads, which are supposed to be massively parallel, they figured that these serialized code sections are important. And if you actually go and talk with Sun designers today, Oracle designers today, they will tell you that you would like a big core. So uh, they, they really wanted to get the best of both worlds also. So uh, it, actually, the, the design of, what is this? Is it Oracle T4 or T5? We've talked about this before. But the design of Oracle T5 is an out-of-order execution engine. So it's very different from this one. But this is to give you, uh, that, that, that's, not, that's not to say that's the best choice. What we really want is to meet the demands, remember. We don't necessarily want one size fits all. In a serialized code section, we would like powerful cores. In a parallel code section, we'd like wimpy, many wimpy small cores like not, some Niagara. Whereas in a serialized code section, we'd like something like a beefed up power four, maybe a Haswell. So these two conflict with each other, obviously. So the key question is, can we get the best of both worlds? And whenever this question is asked, one option is, well, why don't we have heterogeneity? Why don't we have both and utilize them in a good way? So let's take a look at how we can achieve this. I'll just, uh, I'll give you a brief uh, quantitative view of this. Uh, what kind of performance do you get with, with what kind of parallelism you have in the hardware? Let's assume that the small core takes an area budget of one and has performance of one, and a large core takes an area budget of four and has performance of two. 
This is the tile large approach, tile a few large cores, and we've seen some examples. Uh, high performance on single thread serial code sections. W what if you have single thread? How much performance do you get? You get two units of performance, right? Because of this assumption. Large core takes an area budget of four and a performance of two. And you can run a single thread in one large core only. The problem here is you get low throughput on parallel program portions. If your program is parallel, you get eight units of performance, right? One, two, three, four. Well, why eight? Because if you have a performance of two, you can time multiplex the thread. You can execute one thread for one and the other thread for two, right? You actually, a, a thread actually takes 0 0.5 T uh, in the large core if it takes one T in the small core. Does that make sense? Okay, you'll think about it and <laughs> it'll make sense. A large core can execute a, sing a single thread at half the time a small core can execute in time units. So if you look at the small tile small approach, you tile many small cores. And this is actually present in some systems today. Tile air tile has 100 wimpy cores like this. You get high throughput on the parallel part. Basically, you get 16 units of performance because you have 16 of these small cores. But you get very low performance on the serial part, single thread. You get one unit. Right? You don't get two units that we had in the previous part. So tile large, this is the advantage. High performance of si on single thread, low throughput on parallel program portions. Tile small, high throughput on the parallel part, but low performance on the serial part. And if you actually go from this approach, or a single large core, to many small cores, then you actually see reduced single thread performance compared to existing single thread processors. And we, nobody wants that, right? You're a programmer who writes a program. It executes greatly. And then next generation processor, it slows down by half. Well, who wants that? And uh, actually, the software industry has grown so much because of the improvements in single thread performance that have been provided over decades. That's why we, we see all these new applications and new features in, in the applications. And if you actually pull it down, if, you, if, the, if the performance goes down, then we cannot generate new applications. Remember, that's, the, that's one of the first slides that we've talked about when we talked about why study computer architecture. So we don't want this, certainly. But we do want uh, the best of both worlds. So the idea is, to, is simple by now, right? We'll have both large and small cores on the same chip, basically performance asymmetry. Uh, asymmetry is the same thing as heterogeneity. And I'll use these words interchangeably. So let's take a look at uh, these asymmetric multi-cores now. So this is one design, one potential design. You can actually improve upon it. But we have one large core and 12 small cores in this case. In the serial portion, you get two units of performance. Right? So you get, the, you get the best performance of the tile large. In the parallel part, you can execute the parallel part on small cores. So you get 12 units of performance. And in the large core, you get two units of performance. You can execute two threads. Right? So you get 14 uh, in a time multiplex manner. You get 14 units. It's not exactly 16. Right? The hope is that actually you can multi-thread the large core. I mean, you, can, you may be able to get 16 units of performance. So if you have a single thread, now you can accelerate the serial bottlenecks, right? It just runs on the large core when you have a single thread. And when you have many threads, they go to the small cores as well as the large core. OK. That's a nice animation that <laughs> shows the benefit. And you can, you can actually do the calculations. Uh, I'll not go into this in detail, but this is, the, this is what I've shown in the previous slide. Tile large approach gets best serial performance, but bad parallel performance. Tile small gets. Uh, bad, parallel, bad serial performance, but the best parallel performance. And hopefully, a symmetric multi-core can get the best of both worlds. Here, it cannot get best parallel performance, but you can actually have multi-threading in the large core to get, hopefully, better parallel performance. OK. So that's accelerating serial bottlenecks. That's, the idea is simple, right? When you have a single thread, execute on the large core. But that's, that's kind of easy, right? <laughs> when you have a single thread, uh, if you have an asymmetric multi-core, you'd probably like to execute that on the large core anyway. Right? But the realization is that you should have this asymmetry. What about the parallel bottlenecks? These are harder. Uh, so serialized or imbalanced execution in the parallel portion, these bottlenecks, like this pipeline stages uh, that are limiting, perhaps can be accelerated on the large core as well. Examples are critical sections that are contended and parallel stages that take longer than others to execute. We'd like to identify them somehow and ship them to the large core. And that's the idea. Dynamically identify those code portions that cause serialization 
or predict them early on and execute them on a large core. So I'll talk about accelerated critical sections a little bit. That's one way of improving parallel performance, uh, improving the critical section uh, performance, parallel part performance using an asymmetric multicore. By the way, this asymmetric multicore actually exists today. Right? We've talked about ARM's uh, big dot little architecture. You have one large core and three small cores, I believe. That's at a very small scale. But it's not used in the same way that we're going to describe. It's not necessarily used, at least as far as we know, to accelerate parallel uh, portions of the program. Right now it's used for an energy optimization. That's another reason to uh, talk about asymmetry, to have per, uh, performance asymmetry. If you have, if you want to maximize energy efficiency, you would like to fit the code, you'd like to execute the code on the core that's most efficient for that code. For example, you have a lot of serial dependence chains in your single thread. You still may not want to execute that code on a large core, right? Because you may not be able to extract any parallelism out of that thread anyway without order execution. Remember, every instruction is dependent on every other one. Out of order execution is useless. So if you identify this characteristic, maybe you ship that thread to a small core and execute it much more energy efficiently with similar performance. So you could use an asymmetric multicore for that purpose as well. And keep that in mind. Again, there the goal is to maximize energy efficiency. OK. So let me motivate this problem. This is, this is a cool graph. It's just analytical. Let's say we have 12 iterations of a program, and we have 33% of the instructions inside a critical section. I'm going to show you a timeline in abstract time units to see how long it takes to execute this program uh, on a processor with one core. Well, one core, it takes 12 time units. That's what I'm going to assume. If you have two cores, you have two threads, and these two threads will execute things in parallel. When one is in the critical section, uh, the other will not be, but they will not contend for the critical section because now you can overlap the latency of the parallel part with the critical section, assuming things are nice for you, assuming they don't arrive at the critical section at the same time, right? And that's what I've shown here. So you can improve performance significantly, right, if you do this. Uh, if you have three threads, Again, you can improve performance significantly compared to two threads. Now the threads are executing on the, there's, there's at least one thread, well, there's at, at most one thread on the critical section at any given time, but there is one thread at the critical section at any given time over here. And that's the key realization here. And because of that, if you increase the number of threads, your performance does not improve. Why? Because here, this three-thread version of the program is bottlenecked by the critical section. At any given point in time, there is one thread executing a critical section. Right. So if you add more threads, you will not be able to overlap the non-critical section with the critical section. And that's what happened here. We added more threads. Now some threads need to wait for the uh, other threads to get out of the critical section. So performance does not improve. In fact, it's an optimistic figure. right? Because performance actually degrades as you add more threads because of the communication overhead. You, add, you added one more thread. Now there's more communication that needs to happen on chip. When one needs to acquire the lock, then that lock goes to one more processor. Right. So this is basically this, because this program with three threads were bo was bottlenecked by critical sections, critical section is on the critical path of execution, adding more threads did not improve performance. So what if we magically accelerated these critical sections by 2x? Let's take a look at what the programs would look like. Well, you would improve the performance of a single-threaded version also. And then you would improve the performance of the two-threaded version. You'll improve the performance of the three-threaded version. You would actually improve the performance of the four-threaded version as well. But if you look at this, now you gain benefit by going to four threads from three threads. Right? That's the difference. Here you had no performance improvement if your critical sections were bottlenecking. But if you could accelerate your critical sections, they would not be the bottleneck anymore in this three-threaded version. Right? If you look at this, there are some times where no thread is in the critical section. So critical sections are not on the critical path of execution. That's why we gain benefits by going to four threads. Now we improve the performance of the program by magically accelerating critical sections by 2x. But we also improve the scalability. Right? Performance now saturates at a number of threads that's larger than three. It's four. In fact, maybe it's more, right? Because even here, you get, some, uh, you get some parts of the program that are executed where no threads, no thread is in the critical section. Make sense? So that's what we're going to try to achieve. 
So accelerating in critical sections increases performance and scalability. And uh, contention for critical sections leads to the serial execution. And this increases with the number of threads and limits scalability. And I've already shown you this graph. This is what we have today with uh, the MySQL. And a symmetric multi-core can get you this. And obviously, the idea is uh, simple right now. But before, before I give you the idea, basically, we would like to accelerate serial, serialized code sections by shipping them to powerful cores and asymmetric multi-core. One could argue that, why do this, right? Why not punt the problem to the programmer? But given that you've taken this course, now you know very well why not, right? Why not is written here. Well, you can probably tell me why not as well, right? These, ex the execution time of these sequential parts, critical sections, limiter stages, should be short. But it's difficult for the programmer to shorten these serialized code sections. Why? Because the programmer time is very, very valuable, right? They have limited resources. Maybe you can spend your entire life optimizing a parallel program, but you have to market the software at some point in time, right? Besides, it's hard to reason about some of these critical sections. As you, improve, as you try to improve performance, you may, how do you improve performance? You try to minimize the critical section. How do you minimize a critical section? You try to reduce the synchronization that happens in the program. How do you do that? By perhaps eliminating locks, or by perhaps reducing the boundary that's protected by the locks. Now, it's easy to make mistakes when you do that. So you get a lot of performance, uh, a lot of bugs in the program, correctness bugs, by trying to improve the performance of your program. So it's difficult for the programmer to do that. Oracle invests a lot of money for their expert programmers to improve their database, and they still have limitations in critical sections, and they've done this for decades. Whereas if you are a company, if you're, a, if you're your own person, and you have a great idea of an application, and you would like to start your own company and use multi-cores, well, you'll face the same problem. You're not Oracle. You cannot dedicate so many engineers to solve that problem, to improve your performance by reducing the size of the critical sections. What are you going to do? Well, maybe there is a mechanism that can help you as a programmer and enable these new applications that can potentially come out instead of saying, programmer, deal with it and figure out how to use it. Right? So that's not a solution again. This is one of the non-solutions to the problem. So the goal is to have a mechanism to shorten these serial bottlenecks without requiring programmer effort. And that's the idea. I think the idea is obvious right now. Basically, hardware and software cooperatively ship the critical sections to a large, powerful core in an asymmetric multi-core architecture. The benefits, actually, we will see some of the other benefits also, but this reduces serialization due to contended locks, reduces the performance impact of hard to parallelize sections, and now the programmer does not need to heavily optimize parallel code. Hopefully, their productivity is improved, and there are hopefully fewer bugs, right? Hopefully, now they can perhaps, they don't know which data is exactly shared but between different threads. They can say, oh, I'll make the critical section huge, right? I'll protect the entire hash table, maybe, something like that. Maybe that's not a good idea in general. Instead of protecting hash table in a fine grain, e e having a lock for each bucket, they can have a lock for the entire hash table. Now, that's a lot easier to get correct than having fine grain locks. And hopefully, the hardware transparently improves performance by figuring out these critical sections. So that's the idea. I think this is a nice uh, picture for it. Uh, this is a critical section. Uh, to support this, we have one large core, and large core has a critical section request buffer. And these different small cores are clients to the large core. Different small cores can say, large core, execute this critical section for me and return the result and write it to uh, memory somewhere. And tell me when you're done so that I can go, go ahead with my parallel part. So you need this critical section request buffer that queues up requests from small cores. And let's say, Processor 2 encounters a critical section. This is demarcated with a critical section call instruction. That's why you need some support from the software, not necessarily the programmer. Uh, and this, when, uh, then Pro Processor 2 sends this critical section call request to this critical section request buffer. At some point, Processor 1 executes the critical section. And when it's done, it sends a critical section down signal to Processor 2, and Processor 2 can continue now. So this is very much like a remote procedure call that happens on chip, right? The small core says, executes a remote procedure on the large core. And the large core executes that remote procedure on, on the small core's behalf. Yes? But this is assuming that the critical section is long enough mm -hmm. to actually send it over to another core is worth the time of doing it. So that's a great question. We'll, we'll refine the mechanism later on. So this is right now we're going to ship every critical section. But 
if we get to it, and hopefully we'll get to it, we'll, we'll find a way of figuring out what actually is really a good idea to ship there. But that's absolutely true. But even the dumb mechanism actually improves performance in applications where critical sections are uh, an important bottleneck. So it's not, it's not only the length, actually. It's, all, it's how, much, how much of a bottleneck the critical section is, how much it's causing other threads to wait. Uh, there's also another part of it. It doesn't get accelerated if, if you send it to the large core. Maybe the critical section does not get accelerated, right? So the mechanism that I'll talk about does not take those into account. But you're definitely on the right path. OK, so how does this work? Basically, you have the small core. This is the code for the small core. This is how you would write code as, as a parallel programmer. You lock uh, the critical section. And the critical section is this one in this case. And you unlock it. And later, there's a result that's printed. In a symmetric multi-core system that employs accelerated critical sections, this is what the code looks like, as well as the execution looks like. But small core does it. It computes something. And then it pushes the value uh, that's used by the critical section onto the stack. So this does not exist in the original code, because there's no need to communicate uh, with the stack here. And then there's a critical section call uh, with the lock x uh, to a target program counter. Target program counter starts from the beginning of the critical section. When this critical section call is executed, there is a request sent through the interconnect to the large core. It's called the critical section call request. Uh, the x, the lock address, the program counter, uh, the target program counter, the stack pointer, and the core ID is sent to the large core. And when the large core receives it, it queues it up in this request buffer in FIFO order. And when, the, uh, when this critical section request becomes uh, the top in that uh, critical section request buffer and the large core is not busy anymore, it executes the code. It starts from the target program counter. It acquires a lock. It pops. There's code uh, added to the critical section by the compiler or the library. Or if you're an ambitious programmer, you could do that too. Uh, that pops the inputs that were pushed on the stack. These are the inputs to the critical section. Execute the critical section. It pushes the result on the stack. It releases the lock and executes a critical section return instruction. When this is executed, a response is sent to the small core saying, small core, now you can continue execution. And there's uh, code added to the small core on top of this that pops the result. And now you can print the result. So that's the execution with accelerated critical sections. There's additional instructions, critical section call, critical section return. And also there are push and pop instructions as well that are additional, that already exist, hopefully. That's the idea. Does that make sense? So you could actually imagine hardware doing this purely transparently. Right? This is not transparent to the hardware. Somebody, somebody needs to add these critical section call and critical section return instructions. Somebody needs to modify the code. As long as critical sections are somehow marked by the programmer, this is easy to do for the library and the compiler. And many programmers, uh, programming models today, like OpenMP, if you've done programming there, you mark the critical sections. If you don't mark the critical sections, then this is tougher. Right? Then somehow the compiler needs to reason about what is shared and what is not shared, if you're doing synchronization or not. So the, the main requirement is marking the critical sections. If you want to do this purely in hardware, meaning that hardware detects the critical sections automatically, if you take 740, we'll discuss mechanisms to do that, actually. It's tougher because, because of the same reason. right? If the compiler cannot detect these critical sections by code analysis, it's a lot harder or a lot more overhead for the hardware to detect them. But there are potential possibilities there, too. OK, what is the problem with this? I guess I already flashed something over here. What if you have independent critical sections? You have two critical sections that have nothing to do with each other. I guess I'll go up here. Critical section one protected by lock x and unlock x. Critical section two protected by lock y. Now two cores execute both critical sections. If they're executing independently, they should really execute in parallel, right, these two critical sections, because lock x has nothing to do with lock y. Well, if you have an accelerated critical section system, you can get into what's called false serialization, right? Because both of the cores now send their request to the large core, and you serialize the execution of independent critical sections. Large core is, large. Large core is what? Is a large yeah, large core is essentially a yeah, you can think of it as a lock at some level that serializes the execution of all critical sections. And we, you don't want that, right? 
You would like to get parallelism in these cases. And uh, so the idea here is uh, an idea uh, that detects this case, detects when this false serialization happens, and uh, basically avoids it. And the idea is simple. Basically, whenever uh, the large core receives uh, requests from the small cores, those are queued at the critical section request buffer. And this critical section call to A can execute, which means that it's not falsely serialized, right? But let's say you have another critical section call to A. Again, this is not falsely serialized. It's okay to serialize them because actually you should serialize them, right? That's the semantics of the program. But if a critical section call to B comes, this is a, from a different lock, and I've renamed X to A and Y to B here so that you can follow this example. Now critical section call B needs to wait these critical section calls to A to finish in the large core. Well, it's too bad. The hard, large core now can figure this out, right? It's easy to figure it out. You, fi you look at the queue and figure out how many critical sections are waiting falsely, even though they're waiting for different locks. And you can increment some counters. B has been serialized five times, and A has been serialized only two times. If that counter re uh, reaches a threshold, then the large core can say, small core, stop sending me your critical section B, because I'm serializing it. I'm doing the wrong thing with that. So you can actually fix this. Uh, problem. So what are the performance trade-offs associated with it? I think I've, well, I guess I've already flashed the other performance trade-offs. <laughs> Faster critical section execution is obvious. I should have really uh, asked you this. But there are other performance benefits, which we have briefly talked about earlier. Now your shared locks stay in one place. Right? You get better lock locality. The large core is where the locks are only handled. Locks don't get handled in the small cores. Locks are turned into a critical section call uh, signals, instructions. Similarly, your shared data stays in large cores, hopefully large caches. If you're designing a large core, it makes no sense to design it with a very small cache. Hopefully, you have a large cache for that, which means that you hopefully have better shared data locality and less ping-ponging. In fact, if you're executing all critical sections on the large core, you should really have no shared data on the small cores, right? no shared cache blocks on the small cores. Can you think of one reason why you may have some cache blocks that ping pong between the large core and the small core? Even if you have perfect, perfectly accelerated critical sections. So you're executing uh, critical sections on the large core. Uh, and critical sections are never executed on the small cores. The hope is that shared data stays in large cores, large caches. So there's no ping ponging. But you have a system, this is a good, good exam question, for example, that just came to my mind. You have a system where you observe this ping ponging. Okay. I guess, first of all, can that happen? If that happens, why? If it cannot happen, why not? Yes? Well, critical sections already require data from outside the critical section to operate. Okay. So if that data is generated by a small core, then, then the large core will have to read from there. Uh -huh. And then you will make some caches and create some new cache. But the next time before it goes into critical section again, the small code writer again, yes. you have to put in the data again. Exactly. That's, so that's one reason. That's a good reason. There is a more subtle reason too. But the, uh, the, the first reason is basically private data is needed by the critical section. Right? Thread private data. Uh, I, I would call this thread private data. Even though this is not shared between different threads, for the critical section to execute, remember we pushed that A to the stack such that the uh, small, uh, large core can read it. Right? So this private data is needed by the critical section, so that can lead to ping ponging. Let's assume that there is no private data. Can there be another reason? Well, there is private data, but uh, it's not communicated to the critical section. We discussed this when we talked about cache coherence, granularity of cache coherence. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You cannot false share, right? So that's the answer in an exam, for example. You can say false sharing and shared data and private data can be located in the cache line, in the same cache line, cache block. As a result, even though there is no really sharing of data 
large core sometimes has the cache block because it needs to operate on shared data, and sometimes a small core has a cache block because it needs to operate on the private data. And this is because of the granularity of coherence, as you remember from a previous lecture. If your granularity of coherence was actually at the word level, then this would not happen. But, uh, the, yeah. You could potentially, yeah, you could potentially uh, solve this problem at software, but uh, it may be harder. Now you need to figure out what your cache block size is, right? You could keep your, all of your locks in the same cache block. That's right. That actually improves lock locality also. That's a good idea in general, if you can keep your locks uh, in the same cache block. Okay, so in the absence of these two things, well, I guess shared data, uh, shared data uh, you get better shared data locality. So what are the minuses? One minus is large core is dedicated for critical sections. So this leads to reduced parallel throughput, and we've seen this in, in ACMP earlier also. And we'll look at these minuses. Whenever you have a mechanism, it's always good to do this analysis and figure out what are the minuses and try to fix the minuses. False serialization, I'm not going to add that to the minus here, but if I didn't talk about false serialization, that would have been a minus. So you have now some other overhead. You don't have locks, locking overhead, locking better lock locality. You get rid of the lock ping-ponging. But now those are converted, if you will, into CS call and CS done control transfer signals. And these are, if these are actually taking a long time, you have overhead, right? And this is the uh, thing that we discussed here. Thread private data needs to be transferred to the large core. You, so you get worse private data locality. Remember, if you did not ship the critical sections to some other core, private data would have very nice locality in the thread's cache, in, in that core's cache. So we create a problem by solving another problem. Now, actually, this is, this is an easier problem to handle. And if we get to it today, we'll talk about mechanisms. So the key idea is it's a lot easier to identify for the compiler or the hardware this thread private data. Because this is essentially the input to the critical section, right? Once you've identified that, you can actually, when you're shipping the critical section, you can also ship this data somehow. You can have a hardware mechanism that marshals the cache blocks that are going to be needed by this critical section. That are, the, uh, the, uh, marshals the cache blocks that are written by the thread and used by the critical section. This is called data marshalling for multi-core architectures. And I will probably not get to it in detail, but that's the idea. Ship the data as well as while you're shipping the critical section call. Yeah. And you can read this if you're interested. It's an ISCA 2010 paper. Increasingly, you will need this kind of mechanism to minimize the communication overhead uh, as you parallelize programs. So if you think about this, this is very similar to what we've discussed earlier, right? Remote procedure call. I know you guys ne not necessarily have taken network, uh, networking courses, but if you're programming a distributed system, uh, and if you're pro programming clients and servers, when you, when you, when you ex uh, a client requests some function to be executed by a server because the server has the data, right? That's what's done in distributed systems programming today, a remote procedure call. And the input data that's needed by that function that's, all, that's present in the client is all, also sent by the programmer to the server. That's essentially called marshalling, data marshalling in the distributed systems community. Right? That's how you do distributed systems programming, RPC programming. If you're interested, you can do that, actually. It's a lot of fun. That's a lot of uh, how, how programming is done in a lot of these companies, like Facebook, for example, large-scale distributed systems. Uh, so the difference here is, the hardware is doing it automatically, right? You're somehow identifying what needs to be communicated to this critical section as an input, and you're automatically doing it. The programmer is not specifying which cache blocks should be sent. Program it's not exposed to the programmer. Okay, so hopefully we'll get to it. Let's take a look at these performance trade-offs. Uh, the first trade-off was this, right? You, large core is dedicated for the critical sections. So you have fewer parallel threads that's the downside. The upside is you're accelerating critical sections. So it turns out accelerating critical sections offsets the loss in parallel throughput in many applications. And this trade-off, if you look forward into the system design, as you increase the number of cores in the system, so hopefully you'll have many, many cores, 
So you can have many, many wimpy cores. So the fractional loss in parallel performance decreases as you increase the number of cores. What does this mean? Uh, if you have eight cores, if you have area that's equivalent to eight cores, eight small cores, and if you dedicate four of them uh, to a large core, you have only four out of eight remaining, which is you've lost 50%, four out of eight of your parallel throughput. Whereas if you have 100 cores, 100 small cores, that's your area budget, and if you dedicate only four of that to the large core, then you've lost only four out of 100 of your parallel throughput. Okay. So if you have many cores, this becomes less of an issue. Dedicating one, one large core to uh, the execution of a single thread or a serialized code section becomes less of an issue. Yes? That's right. That's why you need to use interconnects that are more scalable that we talked about last time. The interconnect becomes worse, but that does improve. That does reduce the baseline performance also. So you need to you need to have a way of designing the interconnect in a scalable way. Okay. And also, as you increase the number of cores, increased contention for critical sections makes acceleration more beneficial too. So what's, uh, uh, let's take a look at the better lock locality. You get better lock locality with accelerated critical sections, but you have this overhead of critical section call and critical section down signals. And this avoidance of ping-ponging of locks, locks moving from one thread's cache to another thread's cache over and over, uh, you, uh, you reduce the overhead of that lock locale, uh, this ping-ponging. Whereas CS call and CS done is, not, is really not that much of an overhead. You always send the signal to the large core and some small core. Let's take a look at the sh uh, uh, cache misses for private data versus fewer misses for shared data. So as you add accelerated critical sections, you get few misses for shared data. Right? Ideally, all of your shared data stays in the large cache of the large core. But you get more misses for private data because of the reason that we've discussed. Now your private data needs to be shipped to the large core. Now this is actually a trade-off. It turns out there are programs. That now, now the benefit, what benefit you get depends on what is bigger. Is your private data bigger? How much private data do you input to the critical section? Or is the amount of stuff that you operate on that's shared is bigger? Which one causes you more cache misses? What is your answer to this intuitively? What do you think? Does the number of cache blocks that you touch that are shared exceed the number of cache blocks that are not shared, that are input to the critical section? Any intuitive answer? No? So you have some shared data uh, that is uh, shared between threads. And uh, there are some number of cache blocks that you touch in that data, shared data, let's say a linked list. You touch some part of that linked list. And you figure out how many cache blocks you touch, number of shared cache blocks. And you have that number. This is, let's say, number shared. And you have some number of cache blocks that need to be input into the critical section that is touched within the critical section. And you have that number, number of private cache blocks. Which one is bigger? Yes? Probably the private ones. Private ones? Why, why do you think this is bigger? Well, if the data is shared, you probably start out by sharing them because you most likely only read from them and not modify them so much. Uh -huh. uh, most of programs only operate on their own private registers as local members. Therefore, those number of um, data should be larger than the shared that are being modified. Okay. Okay, that could be one program example. <laughs> any any takers on the other side? You're asking which one would be catch more within the critical That's right, yeah. How how many blocks do you touch? Actually the right answer is it depends. <laughs> I'll give you an, uh, the opposite example. And you can easily construct another example. You can easily say, oh you increment a counter that's shared and the inputs are lots of things into the critical section. 
But it turns out you can always, well, this is not a great argument, but you can always optimize your program to reduce private data. You can always do stuff on private data outside the critical section. Right? But for example, let's give an intuitive example. If you're searching for a key, the thread is inputting a key, which is private. It's searching it in a linked list. The linked list can be huge, right? And this linked list is shared across many threads. Many threads are doing this short, uh, search and updating. So the shared data that's being touched to search for this key in that linked list, which is that critical section, is much larger than the private data, which is just one key. That's one example. But it can go the other way around also. So let's take a look at this. I'll give you an example from a task queue. We're going to insert into a priority queue uh, some subproblems. And this is our critical section. Input to the critical section is this new subproblems. New subproblems is one cache block, let's say, or two. And this is a shared data. It's a priority queue. It's a heap. Well, how do you do the insertion? You basically traverse the tree and touch a bunch of shared data blocks. And the only thing that you touch in the private data is only one little element. Right? So if you look at this, one, two, three, four, five, five shared nodes are touched uh, versus one private node. And this is a benchmark. This actually solves a puzzle problem. So this, in this case, the shared data, the, uh, the number of uh, misses that you get on the shared data is likely much higher than the number of misses that you get on the private data. So keeping shared data in one place is a good idea. Now, that's not always the case. That's why we're going to talk about, we talked about the data marshaling. So you can fix the, you can keep shared data in one place, and you can marshal the private data to that place. That way, you can get good locality in both shared data and private data. OK, and cache misses, reduce, uh, cache misses reduce if shared data is greater than private data. And as I told you, this problem can be solved. We'll probably not get to it. So let's take a look at some performance results before we break. Uh, so these are the comparison points. We started with symmetric multicore. This has conventional locking. And then we had asymmetric multicore, which executes MDAL serial part on the large core. And we added accelerated critical sections. Large core executes not only MDAL serial part, but also the critical sections on, the, uh, on itself. I'll give you some results. You can read the paper for the rest. I haven't required it because you have a, your lab assignment. Uh, but if you're enjoying this, you can take a look at the paper. Uh, so you can have, uh, there are two, 12 critical section intensive applications from different domains. And this is a multi-core simulator, just like the one that you're building Right now, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. It has cache coherence in it. And if you have wimpy small cores like this, Niagara-like, and uh, Pentium 4-like large cores, and some on-chip interconnect that has bidirectional ring with five-cycle hop latency, which you need to also model if you would like to simulate something like this that I've just described, you get performance like this. So what is this? Uh, this is the uh, critical section limited benchmarks that we have. This is the average across those benchmarks. And this is uh, y-axis shows a speed up that you get over the symmetric multicore. And this is not uh, labeled nicely. But the first one is, what if you execute the serial part? This is ACMP, basically. What if you execute the serial part on the large core? Uh, and this, uh, the baseline is all small cores. Uh, and the second one is, what if you do accelerated critical sections on top of that? And this comparison, you need to be careful, actually, when you do this, this kind of comparisons. This is important as you go into the future. Uh, this is an equal area comparison. And number of threads that's executed for these different paradigms is set to the best number of threads. So we somehow figure out for each system, because the number of threads that you have for a symmetric multicore system, number of threads that you launch for a program for a symmetric multicore system is very different from the number of threads that you launch for an asymmetric multicore system. Why? Because performance saturates at different number of threads. And it makes no sense to add more threads than the saturation point, right? Then you're not utilizing your system well. So that's very important when you do fair comparisons. Now it turns out, how do you select that number of threads is a problem also when you're a programmer. How do you know whether you should run the program with eight threads versus four threads? That's actually dependent on the input. So there needs to be a dynamic mechanism to decide that as well. So that's a tough problem. But for fair comparison reasons, we are assuming that somehow we magically know that number of best threads. With simulation, you can figure that out right, for a given input set. And that's the, uh, so that's, uh, the number of threads can be different across these different uh, bars. So the first bar, 
shows that if you look at the average, the first bar shows that imp uh, using an ACMP to accelerate serial parts improves performance by about maybe 7% or so. And using accelerated critical sections improve performance by 40%, uh, at least for these workloads. And these workloads actually, to uh, uh, talk about the importance on the programmer, these workloads are workloads where the programmer did not do a great job optimizing the critical sections. Locks are coarse grain. They protect huge parts of the code. These are large critical sections. So if you look at that, the performance benefit is very, very high over there. Whereas uh, on those other workloads, this, these are MySQL database workloads, where the programmer actually did optimize more, where the locks are fine grained, the performance benefits are lower. So that kind of gives you the trade off between the programmer versus microarchitect uh, quantitatively. And this, I don't know if you'll be able to look at all of this, but this is basically this curve over here. We plot the number of cores, this is the area budget. Uh, and in this case, number of threads that, are, that is launched is the same as the number of cores. And for each system, we plot the scalability curve. What is the speed up? This is the speed up curve. What is the speed up that you get as you increase the number of cores? And these are 12 different workloads. And you can see different speed up curves for different workloads, right? If you look at this one, for example, uh, this is actually doing a histogram of pages, I believe. Uh, the, in the baseline system, symmetric multicore or asymmetric multicore, performance saturates at about seven threads. And after that, you go downhill, right? Actually, with 32 threads, the performance you get is much worse than the performance you get with a single thread. Obviously, you should not be running this program with 32 threads, right, on the 32 core system. It'd be, it'd be, you should be running this program with seven threads. Now, if you accelerate, if you do accelerate critical sections, I don't know, this, is, this has a mind of its own. It keeps moving. Uh, the performance saturates at a higher number of threads, at 10 threads here, and you get a lot better performance. If you look at this other workload, these two workloads, they were not scalable at all before, right? As you keep adding more threads, the performance just stays constant here, and it goes down here with MySQL. If you accelerate critical sections, you get actually much more scalable curve. As you keep adding more cores, more area budgets, you get better performance. So you can improve scalability with this. Whenever you see uh, graphs like this, this basically shows the scalability of the hardware as well as the application, right? So the scalability of the application now depends on the hardware as well, right? Because obviously, this application was not scalable on a symmetric multicore, but it now becomes scalable on an asymmetric multicore, right? Accelerated critical sections. Okay. Just to summarize, uh, this is a mechanism that can accelerate critical sections by executing them on a powerful core, such that you get the best of both worlds. Best parallel performance uh, on wimpy cores, and best serial performance on uh, critical sections, at least, on the large cores. And you can read these numbers. So the question is, can we actually generalize the idea? We just talked about critical sections and serial code sections, but there are other serialized code sections, right? Which are limiter stages, perhaps, or barriers. Can we generalize this idea? And maybe there are downsides to this that you pointed out, one of, one, of, one of which you pointed out, right? Do you want to ship every critical section to the large core? Maybe not a good idea, right? Because you may not get benefits from acceleration. Although you may get some other benefits like shared data locales. Right? So that's not clear. So can we generalize this idea and accelerate all bottlenecks by executing them on a powerful core? And after we take a five minute break, I'll talk about a better method for doing this. And then after we're done with this, I think, We'll be done with the lecture. But any questions before you take a break on accelerated critical sections? Actually, now that we have asymmetric substrate, you can actually try this, doing this in software. And what you will find, I believe, when you do that, because we had done those experiments, uh, the software has a lot of overhead. So you can actually get to a critical section and ship that thread to the large core in software. And what you will find is that, uh, and you can do frequency scaling. You can have uh, you can design your cores uh, such that one core has very a lot of uh, a very high frequency, and some other uh, the other cores have low frequency. So you can emulate asymmetry that way in a real system. And when you get to a critical section in software, you can ship uh, that thread to the large core. Now, if you do this in software, that shipping overhead of the thread is much much higher than doing it in hardware. Right? So it turns out you will find that that will probably you may gain performance in some applications, but you will not be able to get the best benefit of the hardware substrate because the hardware doesn't give you primitives to enable that shipping within hardware, right? So the difference here is 
hardware does that thread migration. It migrates that thread, uh, or it migrates some execution to the large core, such that critical sections execute in the large core. If you do it in software, now the software thread needs to migrate. Now that's a lot of higher, uh, a lot of overhead. Yes? It sounds like the work based on GPU execution works very well with the ACS network. Because you have a lot of, like each work will have a lot of threads working lockstep, so they'll reach probably the critical section at the same time. Then all of the threads within the warp shifts their content to the large core. And as the large core starts working, you interleave to another warp, and then you continue execution. So that way you could like reduce the latency of shipping pretty much entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's right. You can, you can actually tolerate the latency of shipping with that case. And you can also tolerate the latency of synchronization operations, which are problematic in uh, GPUs also. That's a good idea. Now we have not examined it, but that may be something interesting to examine. Okay, I guess let's take a break for four minutes and we'll be back at 1.51 and then I'll finish this and hopefully it'll be fun. <laughs> uh, so remember, we were going to generalize the idea of this bottleneck and solve some other problems related to accelerated critical sections. So I'll briefly talk about bottleneck identification scheduling. And going forward, this kind of mechanisms, actually as I briefly mentioned in some other lecture when we talk about memory scheduling, that identify the bottlenecks in a parallel program and tries to do something to optimize the system. For example, accelerate those bottlenecks or uh, reduce the power consumption on everything else that's not a bottleneck will become increasingly important because we would like to maximize, uh, get the best out of the resources that we have if we want to improve efficiency. And uh, identifying the bottlenecks or critical parts of computation and doing something with it to maximize efficiency is a very good way of focusing your efforts in designing a system. So this is a one slide summary. You already know this, right? Performance and scalability of multi-thread applications are limited by the serializing synchronization bottlenecks. There are different types of these. And actually, I will show you that importance of a bottleneck can change over time. This was, we did not really talk about this, but this does change over time. So we'd like to dynamically identify the most important ones and accelerate them. So there are two key questions. How do you actually identify the most critical bottlenecks? How do you efficiently accelerate them? I guess there's one more question. What do you do with something that's not a bottleneck? Well, you minimize the power consumption on its execution such that it doesn't become a bottleneck. Right? That's another question that we do not tackle here. But that's probably a good idea. And that's what ARM's Big Little is doing probably uh, internally uh, somehow. Maybe with, with not with the best mechanisms though. So the solution is bottleneck identification and scheduling. The key idea, somehow the software annotates these bottlenecks with bottleneck call and bottleneck return, which is similar to critical section call and critical section return, and implements waiting for bottlenecks with a special instruction. Uh, we'll call this bottleneck wait. So hardware implements the waiting instead of software implementing the waiting. And we'll see the reason for that. So hardware identifies the bottlenecks that cause the most thread waiting because it knows when a bottleneck is waited upon and it counts the number of cycles uh, that a bottleneck causes waiting for. For example, when a critical section is being waited upon and when a thread is waiting for a critical section, it goes into this bottleneck wait instruction. And bottleneck wait instruction makes that thread wait. While this bottleneck wait instruction is being executed on the thread and the thread is waiting, the hardware keeps track of how many cycles did the thre thread wait. So it can associate that information with each bottleneck in the system. And once it identifies those bottlenecks that are, cause the most thread waiting, the highest number of cycles of waiting, then it can ship those bottlenecks uh, to the large cores of an asymmetric multi-core system. That's the idea. And it turns out this actually outperforms accelerated critical sections and performance improves with more cores. So I've already talked about this, but you can review this at your leisure. Uh, this is just a, another treatment of what are the, uh, basically what is the definition of a bottleneck? Any code segment for which threads contend or wait for. And we've already talked about these different synchronization bottlenecks. Now we are calling them bottlenecks. Let's take a look at why limiting bottlenecks actually change over time. It's actually an interesting uh, uh, observation, even though it may be obvious. Uh, let's say we have this cooked up program where you have a linked list and uh, what we're, two linked lists, initially A is full and B is empty, and we have many threads doing the same thing. What each thread is doing is uh, going through the first full linked list and taking out an element, 
and doing some computation on it and inserting the element into the empty linked list. Every thread is doing this. And you have two critical sections because threads are removing and adding elements to the different linked lists. You have two different critical sections. And if you look at the execution of this cooked up program, uh, this is mm, the time in terms of millions of cycles. And this is the contention number of threads that are waiting for each critical section on a system with 32 threads. Initially, all threads are waiting for, almost all threads, 31 threads are waiting for this critical section because one thread is executing it, right? Over time, the number of threads uh, that are waiting for lock A gets reduced. But during this time, lock A is the limiter, right? Lock B it does not even get contended for a while. And later, lock B becomes the limiter because it, it's becoming a bigger, much bigger linked list. Now, a, thread, a traversal of a thread takes much longer, right? The critical section takes much longer to execute. And in the middle, some lock is a limiter, and it's not clear which one it is. And even in this cooked up program, you see this fine grained changes in which lock is more important. So at this time, you want to accelerate this lock. At this time, you want to accelerate this lock. And here, you need to determine somehow, right? But just to show you that, whenever you cook up an example, this represents some behavior that, program, that some programmer in the world actually writes. This is an example from MySQL database. Limiting bottlenecks actually do change in real applications and even in a more finer grain manner. This is the time. And these are two locks from MySQL with 16 threads and how contended they are. Y-axis shows the contention. Number of threads waiting for each lock. Lock open, this opens the database tables. Lock, uh, lock log is the log, the database log. A lot of databases operate uh, using logs so that, such that you can recover uh, when, you, uh, when, uh, when, there, when, there's a, uh, when two transactions contend. So if you look at this, there are times at which this log lock is more contended than the open lock, and there are times at which this open lock is more contended than the log lock. And you see that uh, this changes at a very, very fine grain. This is millions of cycles. Software cannot find this, right? If you think about the software time schedule in quantum, it's 10 milliseconds or so in many systems. This is much smaller than 10 milliseconds. So we've already talked about some of these things. Uh, I will not go into detail, but if you look at the, actually there is one thing that I will briefly talk about, feedback directed pipelining. Remember we talked about this pipeline parallelism and uh, you can have a limiter stage and ideally you would like to accelerate that stage. You can actually design software libraries to achieve everything that we've discussed, except the overhead will be low as we discussed with accelerated critical section. Software migrates the thread that gets to a critical section to a large core. Overhead is very large for that. Or alternatively, you can have feedback-directed pipelining. You can have software that measures what is the throughput of each stage. How many stage uh, instances per cycle or per second that we're completing on different processors. And if the throughput is really low in one stage, that means that that's the bottleneck. Right? And you can detect this in software by having hardware counters or actually by instrumenting your own program that you wrote. And if the throughput goes, becomes the lowest, you can ship that stage, you can start shipping that stage, start, you can start executing that stage on a large core right, if you have the substrate. And that's the idea of feedback directed pipeline. It's a software based library that can do this. But that's actually very uh, coarse grained. So hardware, uh, hardware support can make, this, ma make these things much more efficient. So basically, you would really like a general proposal that can accelerate all types of bottlenecks and adapt to fine grained changes in the importance of bottlenecks. If you, if you have a software solution, it's very, very hard to adapt to those fine grained changes that's on the order of millions of cycles. You can adapt to uh, things that are at the order of milliseconds, but very hard to do millions of cycles. So goal is to have a general mechanism as we discussed, right? To identify and accelerate performance limiting bottlenecks. So the idea is very simple actually, as with a lot of mechanisms. The key insight is thread weighting is what reduces parallelism and what is likely to reduce performance. And the code causing the most thread weighting is likely on the critical path critical path of a multi-threaded application. So why don't we dynamically identify these bottlenecks that cause the most thread weighting and accelerate them using powerful cores in an ACMP? So the uh, solution is hardware software cooperative. Somebody needs to annotate the bottleneck code. It could be the compiler, the library, if the programmer uh, actually programmed nicely. Or it could be the programmer, hopefully not. Uh, and somebody needs to implement weighting for bottlenecks using a bottleneck weight instruction. And then the result of this is a binary containing this BIS instructions, as we call them. And the hardware using these instructions measures the thread weighting cycles for each bottleneck and accelerates the bottlenecks with the highest thread weighting cycles. Let's take a look at what's needed 
from the compiler or library or the programmer. Hopefully not the programmer again, right? So I'll focus on the critical section example. This is what a critical section looks like. Uh, we briefly talked about Decker's algorithm at uh, a couple of uh, lectures ago, right? And this is kind of an implementation of it. So while you cannot acquire the lock, you have a waiting loop that looks for an address. Uh, if that address changes, then you stop waiting and you can acquire the lock. And so hopefully some other thread writes to that address and changes it when it releases the lock, right? And you need to implement this correctly, obviously, to get it right. And once, once the thread can acquire the lock, it acquires the lock and then releases the lock. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this out, outline it to a function call, and we're going to replace the original part of the program with a bottleneck call, and the compiler and the library and the system, and the linker, actually, assigns bottleneck IDs to each bottleneck, and this bottleneck starts at this target program counter. And at the end of the bottleneck, we're going to return to the, uh, to the next instruction. I guess I've already talked about this. But one, thing, one other thing we will do is we're going to change this wait loop to a hardware implemented wait. So instead of doing this in software, which is a while, another while actually, we're going to do a bottleneck wait that takes in the bottleneck ID and watches this address. Now the idea is the hardware can count how many cycles that this thread waits for this lock, this bottleneck ID, and associate the importance of a lock uh, of a bottleneck ID uh, with number of cycles, it, uh, the waiting it causes. So it's used to keep track of waiting cycles. And these are used to enable acceleration. Delineating the bottleneck enables acceleration such that the hardware knows, oh, this is a bottleneck call. Now you can actually do this for barriers also. This is a barrier. And while not all threads are in the barrier, you do a bottleneck wait. Right. And you can actually do this for pipeline states, and I'll let you examine this. You can read the paper. But these are actually par parallel programming constructs. You may get to write at some point in your lives. This is essentially, uh, actually I'll spend some time on this. So uh, this is what a pipeline parallel program looks like. Each stage has an input queue and an output queue, and this is the input queue. Uh, and each stage looks like a loop, infinite loop. Uh, with some exit conditions. Well, this is one way of doing it. So in each iteration of the loop, the stage takes an input from its queue and then dequeues the work and then does the work and it tries to output the result into the output queue. And the next stage hopefully takes uh, the result from that queue, right? Now, if the input queue is empty, the thread needs to wait, right? Because there's no input. Somebody did not produce the input. So it's a bottleneck. The previous thread, the previous stage is a bottleneck because it's not, really uh, it's not really giving anything to this thread. If the output queue is full, then the next stage is probably a bottleneck, right? Next thread is making, next stage is making this stage wait because the output queue is full. This, this stage is producing lots of results and this stage is not consuming that fast enough. Now you can attribute waiting cycles to these different stages. And that's what a pi pipeline parallel program actually looks like. So now that we've identified these bottleneck weights and bottleneck returns, we're going to communicate to the hardware. So what does the hardware do? Uh, first thing, actually, what we've discussed earlier, bottleneck identification and acceleration are independent tasks. You can do acceleration in many different ways. You can increase core frequency and voltage. This is one way. Now this works nicely for computation-bound bottlenecks, right? If you're memory-bound, this probably doesn't work because memory, you, you don't increase the memory frequency. You do increase the core frequency. You can pri you do prioritization and shared resource. And we've discussed this briefly when we talked about memory scheduling. If you identify the critical bottleneck, the memory controller can prioritize that, right? This was actually part of your exam question also. Or you can do migration to faster cores in an asymmetric CMP. And you can actually, this is again, as I said, this could be a general way of doing resource management, but we're going to focus on uh, this part. How do you do that? So how does the hardware measure thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck? Let's look at it pictorially. You have some small cores and some large cores. And we're going to add a bottleneck table that keeps track of the bottlenecks. And when a, a small core executes bottleneck waits for this bottleneck ID, the bottleneck table records that bottleneck ID and increments the number of waiters and starts with thread waiting cycles. And while that core is waiting for that bottleneck, the bottleneck table keeps incrementing thread waiting cycles. And later, small core 2 executes the same bottleneck wait. Now the waiter is increased right, to 2. And this bottleneck table now increments the thread waiting cycles with the number of waiters. So that keeps getting incremented. At some point, small core is done executing bottleneck wait, and wait number of waiters gets reduced. 
So basically, this bottleneck table keeps track of how many, which bottlenecks are in the system, in this table, how many waiters are on it, and what is the thread waiting cycles for that bottleneck. And later, small cores is done with the bottleneck. And that's how you measure thread waiting cycles, right, with some hardware support. Now, you could do this in software also, except it gets messy, right, because you need to have shared memory variables, and there's a lot of overhead that's involved in this. You cannot do it at a cycle by cycle level, definitely. You have to do it at a much coarse grain level. In fact, in hardware, you, do, you may not want to do it at a cycle by cycle level also, right, because of power reasons. You probably want to, want to do it at a granularity that's on the order of tens of cycles or maybe fifties of cycles. But in the software, you're, you, you're doomed to do it at the order of milliseconds. Or if you're lucky, if you're in a system that exposes a much lower latency, then you can do it maybe in microseconds. But that's, even that's tough. Okay, so how do we accelerate these bottlenecks? Now that we recorded some things in this bottleneck table, let's take a look at when the small core, what, what happens to the small core when the small core executes bottleneck call to bottleneck ID 4600. At that point, the small core says, uh, ask the bottleneck table, bottleneck table, should I actually accelerate this bottleneck? Should I execute it locally or remotely? That request goes to the bottleneck table. Bottleneck table checks if this bottleneck exists. And if it exists, the thread, if the thread waiting cycles is less than some threshold. In this case, thread waiting cycles is 100, and it happens to be less than that threshold. So the bottleneck table tells the small core to execute the bottleneck locally. Your bottleneck is not important. You, it has not made uh, other threads wait for too long. So the small core can execute that bottleneck locally. Now as the small core gets to bottleneck 4700, it sends a message to the bottleneck table. It turns out this bottleneck 4700 has lots of thread waiting cycles. So bottleneck table says, execute this bottleneck remotely. So the small core now does this accelerated critical section like migration. And it's not really migration, it's an execution request to the large core saying that large core, please execute this bottleneck on my, on my behalf. So large core, to be able to support that, it has a scheduling buffer. This is similar to a critical section request buffer, except it's a little bit different because what we will do is we will order the bottlenecks based on their thread waiting cycles, based on their importance. If a bottleneck has caused lots of thread waiting, the prediction is that it's a lot more important than a bottleneck that, uh, that caused less thread waiting than it. So it's not FIFO anymore. And uh, the small core ships the bottleneck ID, program counter, stack pointer, core ID, similar to accelerated critical sections. And that gets, it starts waiting in the scheduling buffer. At some point, this becomes a bottleneck with the highest thread waiting cycles, hopefully. So I'm saying hopefully because whenever you order bottlenecks with the thread waiting cycles, you can run into starvation, right? So you need to have mechanisms that ensure that this bottleneck actually gets executed sometimes. Actually, uh, this bottleneck gets executed, not sometimes. And uh, at some point, large core actually takes this bottleneck and executes it. And when it's done, uh, there's a bottleneck return at the end of the bottleneck, as you've seen. It sends a done signal saying, the small core, I've executed your bottleneck, now go on with your task, go on with your thread. So that's the idea. So obviously, this bottleneck table is uh, a limiter, right? It's global here in the middle. And you don't want to access the bottleneck table every time to uh, ask, should I execute locally or remotely? So what you can do is to reduce the latency of that, because that adds latency to, to your execution. And if the answer is executed locally, that latency you don't really want. Actually, even if the answer is executed remotely, you don't want that latency, because that's additional latency. So what we do is you can cache the entries in this bottleneck table in acceleration index table. So you can solve a lot of the latency problems in uh, computing systems by adding another level of caching. Now, this, these caches get updated periodically by the bottleneck table or with some policy. Okay, so we talked about how do you determine thread waiting cycles, how do you accelerate bottlenecks, but you can actually, yeah, similar issues exist with uh, bottleneck identification and scheduling. You need to deal with forced serialization. You need to actually do some preemptive acceleration and you need to support multiple large cores. And I will not talk about this, but uh, the mechanisms are reasonably simple here. So preemptive acceleration, I will briefly talk about it. You can become a bottleneck uh, running on the small core after executing the bottleneck call instruction. Think about a barrier. Uh, a barrier, you're executing the run, uh, code running uh, for the barrier. And at some point, you become the only thread that's executing that code. Every other thread has reached the barrier. At that point, you somehow need to figure out, the bottleneck table actually figures out that that barrier this code is core is executing has become the critical bottleneck. And this needs to be figured out after 
the bottleneck call is executed. And at that, at that time, the bottleneck table needs to tell that core, oh, I found out that you're executing the last thread that is needed to reach the barrier. So what you need to do is you need to send your, ship your bottleneck to the large core. So you need to have mechanisms for that. And that does complicate, complicate a little bit, but you get a lot of benefit by accelerating that last thread that needs to reach the barrier. So what is the hardware cost of all this? You, need to, you, can, you can look at the paper, but bottleneck table actually uh, can be global with some number of entries, and it has minimum thread waiting cycle replacement. LRU replacement may not be a good idea here, right, because you really want to keep the big bottlenecks. And of course, you need to have some idea of LRU, because if you've executed the bottlenecks and if it was very, very important, and if you're never going to execute that later on, you probably don't want to keep it, right? So it's a cache, it's a specialized cache, basically, or table. You need to have scheduling buffers. You have one table for, per large core, as many entries as small cores, and you need to have these caches of that uh, bottleneck table. And these are all off the critical path, or if, you, 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 if you're a good designer, you should design them to be off the critical path. There's no reason for these to affect your frequency. And it turns out the total storage cost for 56 small cores and two large cores, or 64 small core equivalent system, is less than 20 kilobytes. But it's really the implementation complexity uh, that makes it more difficult, not the storage cost. That's true in general for many mechanisms. Storage cost you can handle somehow, but implementation complexity, if it's really, really complex, that's tougher. So there are a bunch of performance trade-offs that we've briefly discussed, and these exist in BIS also, right? Faster bottleneck execution versus fewer parallel threads. And the trade-off is very similar. You get better shared data locality versus worse private data locality. And you can actually fix that problem with data marshaling as we've discussed. You get the benefit of acceleration versus the migration latency. And uh, it turns out this is less of a problem in BIS. Accelerated critical sections, you would accelerate every critical section to a large core, right? That could be bad if the critical section is not contended, right? Here, if the bottleneck is actually contended, then you're executing other instances of the bottleneck in the large core anyway. So the shipping latency, uh, one core is shipping uh, one instance of the bottleneck to the large core. That additional latency in the bottleneck call is overlapped by the execution of another instance of the bottleneck in the large core. Right? So you can actually overlap a lot of latency here by focusing your efforts on bottlenecks that are really important because they're contained anyway, so uh, your, their latency will be hidden. So uh, this very similar evaluation methodology, I'll not go into this in detail, except uh, we have a more larger scale system right now, and these are very similar. Uh, let's take a look at some results. Comparison points, ACMP is the baseline, this accelerates only Amdahl serial portions, and accelerated critical sections is another mechanism that we've discussed. And this is applicable to multi-thread workloads, it's not applicable to pipeline stages. And feedback directed pipelining is the uh, library that I've discussed. It's a software library that accelerates only slowest pipeline stages. So these are some results. Uh, this normalized, speed up normalized to ACMP, uh, which accelerates serial parts only. And these are the benchmarks. This is the geometric mean. And this is the performance you get with a combination of accelerated critical sections and feedback directed pipelining. And this is a more general mechanism that can accelerate all these different types of bottlenecks. So, these workloads, you, there's a lot of benefits in these workloads because limiting bottlenecks actually change over time significantly, as I've shown you earlier. These workloads have barriers that cannot be accelerated by accelerated critical sections. So this is a mechanism to accelerate barriers. The last reaching thread to the barrier gets accelerated. Actually, you could figure out what are the last n threads that are reaching the barrier because bottleneck table has that kind of information. It can, it can contain that kind of information. I didn't talk about that, but you could actually have that information there. If you look at this, the performance improvement is significant if you accelerate all types of bottlenecks. And take these with a grain of salt, of course. These are, uh, again, high-level simulation results on some set of workloads, right? But the takeaway is there's significant performance differential between accelerating the bottlenecks uh, generally with bottleneck identification and scheduling versus just accelerating critical sections and pipeline stages with different types of mechanisms. And I will not show you the scalability graphs, but scalability graphs actually show that uh, scalability improves on four of these benchmarks. Okay, this is some analysis that uh, uh, I'll let you think about how to do, but this is actually the most fun part in uh, doing this kind of studies, I think. The question is, why does this work? Right. So how do you figure out why this works? So you need to do some analysis of the critical path of the program and figure out whether you're actually identifying the critical path. Right. And that's what we did here. Uh, 
this is ACS and FTS. So this, on the x-axis, what we show for each bar is the fraction of execution time spent on predicted important bottlenecks, meaning the bottlenecks that are identified to be accelerated, that go above the threshold of thread waiting cycles. With a ACS, basically whenever you get to a critical section, it's predicted important, right? And this is the fraction of time that's spent on that. And if you look at this, the fraction of time that's spent on uh, important bottleneck is about 55% uh, with ACS. The question is, what is actually really critical? So what is, uh, ACS predicts these bottlenecks, this much bottlenecks to be critical, but the actually critical portion of, this, uh, of those bottlenecks is this much only. Does that make sense? How do you figure out what's actually critical? Well, you need to somehow do an offline analysis of the critical path of the program, right? Because you need to know what's the, thread that's causing uh, uh, the program to be slow. And you, you need to start with the program, uh, the last thread that's arriving to the end of the program, and now you need to trace back the execution to figure out which thread was, on, was the last thread arriving at different synchronization points. So once you do that, it turns out you can define coverage, which is a fraction of program critical path that is actually identified as bottlenecks. And that coverage is 39% with accelerated critical sections, which goes up to 59% with BIS. So BIS covers 59% of the program critical path, which is still very low, right, 59%. And actually, if you look at this, this poor workload, spec JBB, the coverage is very, very low. It's less than 10% almost. What is accuracy? The accuracy is different, right? Identify bottlenecks on the critical path over total identified bottlenecks. Basically, what fraction of this each bar is green. That's the accuracy. And accuracy is similar between ACS and FDP, uh, ACS and BIS. So it's about 73%. So why is this important? If you improve the coverage of how well you can identify the program critical path, you can accelerate much better. Right? That's why this coverage is important. Why is accuracy important? Well, if you're identifying a portion of the program that's not that critical, that's not on the critical path, then you're wasting your large core resources. You're, you're wasting energy efficiency. Right? So if your accuracy is 100%, you can get, you're actually focusing your efforts on the most important things to execute on the large core. Of course, if your coverage is 100%, then you're actually always executing your critical path on the large core. So you'd like both of these to be closer to 100%. Okay, I think I'll skip this, but it turns out performance increases with more small cores and more large cores. Uh, why? Because as you add more small cores, uh, you get more contention in the system. So this will become more important as you go into the future. As you add more large cores, you can reduce false serialization, basically. You can accelerate independent bottlenecks. And that's fundamental. These are fundamental also. So I think uh, that's all I have. Basically, the key thing is uh, this can provide comprehensive fine-grained bottleneck acceleration with no programmer effort. All the programmer needs to do is somehow demarcate these bottlenecks at the high level. And that's what a lot of programming models provide today. But not all programmers use it. Right? A lot of programmers try to do synchronization at the low level without using these uh, constructs uh, that are provided by the libraries. OK, any questions? None? All right, I guess uh, I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>